Hi folks, so today together with Bogdan, we will answer 30 front-end interview questions in 10 minutes. Question number one, is CSS rendered before or after the DOM is constructed in the critical rendering path? Uh, CSS is rendered before and it's synchronous. So it all has to be interpreted before we start parsing and showing the DOM. On to question number two. HTML is rendered incrementally as is being interpreted. Can we say the same about CSS? No. CSS, it's blocking. So it's all or nothing with CSS. And that's because CSS is a global namespace. So the browser developers made the decision to really interpret all the CSS, calculate any possible rule pointing to a specific element before we move with the HTML. Question number three, which one will be interpreted after the HTML is fully rendered? Is it a sync or the first script that will be interpreted first? It's probably the first. A sync will be interpreted as soon as it was downloaded. So they both start downloading in the background the script, but a sync, as soon as it's downloaded, will get parsed in the background and interpreted randomly time. A defer will actually be done after the DOM finish event triggered. On to question number four. Given that box sizing property of an element, it's border box, it's the padding included in the width calculation. Yes, the padding would be included in the width calculation in the case of border box. On to question number five. Tell me three ways I can optimize my CSS to make my web application faster. Number one, you could clean it up with the coverage tool from the browser to really make sure you're shipping only styles that are used. Number mm -hmm. two, I would say would be compression and caching. And number three would be critical CSS, basically extracting only the CSS you need for the first render and loading the rest of the CSS after the initial render. Number six, what will be the final color of the button? This is an ID, so it has the highest specificity. So probably this one will be applied. So I would say it's green. On to question number seven, what are the different ways to store data in the browser? Basic fundamental question. Um, we can probably use cookies. We could probably use local storage and we could also use session storage. Well answered, let's move on with number eight. What is one advantage and one disadvantage of using closures in JavaScript? So one advantage is having simpler function signatures because we do not need to pass so many things into a function because the function has access to the local and global scope. But the disadvantage would be that we use a lot of memory. The reason for that is because function Functions enclosed so many variables and they cannot be garbage collected that we stop using that function. So JavaScript is traditionally a poor language for a memory handle. On to question number nine. A user presses the submit button too often, triggering too many calls to our backend. How can we fix it? So they are using the submit button. We could do a debounce or a throttle. I think both of them would work because it's a button submission. If this would be an input field and it would be typing, I would say it would be debouncing. But if it's a submit button, Probably throttling could also work. On to question number 10. What is the order of execution? So this is a syn synchronous. So probably this one would be the first. Set mm -hmm. timeout will send this call back to the micro, micro task queue. So we have to wait. Promise resolved to the micro task queue. Script end will execute. So script starts, script end. Then we go to the micro task queue. Promise callback. Then we have the event tick finished. And we in the next tick, we print timeout. Question number 11. What is the time complexity of the following code? When we're using array sort, I think array sort in JavaScript implements an n log n sorting function. So that would be the complexity of this line. Here we have a reduce, which has a complexity of n. We're doing bigger notations. The bigger term will be the dominant one. So we only include that one, which is n logarithm of n because of the sorting. So it's n logarithm of n. Question number 12. Why is person also an employee? This is TypeScript in the following code. We initiate a person, and then we are saying that person is actually of type employee. It probably works because TypeScript has what they call structural typing. So in TypeScript, if two things have the same properties, then they are considered the same. Question number 13. What do ES6 modules allow you to do that require did not? So ES6 modules give you static analysis. That means your, your transpiler or your module bundler knows a lot more about your modules, so it can do things like three shaking. Whereas with require, we don't really know much about the modules until we actually execute require and this will run at runtime. But ES6 modules give you a lot of information already at build time. Number 14, explain this keyword in JavaScript. Okay, so this usually refers to the global uh, scope, where we call this, you console log it, you get the window object in the browser. If you're in an event handler, it will refer to the button or the element that was clicked that triggered the, the event handler. If you're in a normal function, depending on how it was called, or if you're running in strict mode, it points to different things. If it's 
it's street mode, it points to nothing. If it's a method on an object or a class or instance, it will refer to the to the object, you know, the method it's present on. And if you use bind or apply, then it will be uh, whatever you bind it or applied it to. And if it's an arrow function, arrow functions usually don't have its sound, so they inherit it. It's either a global one or method on an object. Question number 15, describe all the steps in an event loop tick. So in an event loop tick, we would have to clean everything that's in the stack. So we run the stack all the way down when there's no more synchronous code to execute. Then we check our micro task queue. So this would be things like if in this code, we actually resolve the promise. We will also like, take the callback of that promise, resolve and execute it. And then we would repaint the browser, make sure that the user gets the updates and that's it. And then we will look at the micro task queue. And when we pick something from the micro task, the next tick started. Number 16, now we are on with React questions. What are the two rules of hooks in React? Number one rule is that hooks should be at the top of the component. That's the easiest one to remember. And the number two is that uh, you should only use hooks inside another hook or inside a React component. Number 17, tell me one thing you can do with class components that you cannot do with functional components. So the keyword here is component lifecycle. Class components allows us to hook into the different lifecycle methods. So if you want to do things like control if a component should re-render, you could do that with should component re-render, or you can add error boundaries, but you can only do that with class components because you have access to lifecycle methods. On to number 18, why can't we use async functions as inputs to the use effect hook? The reason for that is probably because the use effect expects a function and whatever that function returns, use effect would run as a cleanup function when the component gets unmounted. So if you attach something to the scroll event, that's an opportunity for you move that listener. If you don't do that and the component gets rendered multiple times, you will end up attaching many to the scroll event. So the problem with the sync function is they return a promise and the use effect um, API doesn't really understand that promise as a function. On to number 19, what does concurrent React or asynchronous React means? Concurrent React or async React it's the new architecture style of React, uh, which was introduced gradually over several releases, but it's stable with React 18. React internally has a priority queue, and it can pause and restart re-render processes. So if you have, imagine, a low priority render, like you're fetching data and render some components, it can be paused to allow a more higher priority update, like the user scrolling or the user typing in an input field, so that the interface appears much more responsive. Number 20, what is a fiber in React? So in the new architecture, which is this concurrent React, um, React will build fibers for your components. A fiber is what they call a unit of work, but it actually contains all the code of your component, the props, the state, the current memory state. And React will create a tree of those things. And whenever React re-renders, it will actually go through the tree and find the work I need to do. It is this fiber structure that allows React to be able to pause re-renders and move on to higher priority ones. And when it's done with that, come back and start where it left off. Question number 21. Name all all the different ways we can optimize the re-rendering process in React. So probably number one would be avoiding re-renderings. And you can do that with use memo. Basically, if the props coming in are the same as the props you have, you can skip a re-render. And given that you cannot avoid a re-render, then you can probably use things like use memo and use callback to make sure that if you have anything expensive inside the component, it doesn't get recomputed unless the dependencies of that value are actually change. Question number 22, what is rehydration in React, specifically in the SSR world. So if you we do server-side rendering with React, you want to, uh, you send over the pre-render HTML for the, from the backend, but that HTML is not really interactive until you don't attach the virtual DOM to it and all the event handlers. So the first thing we do usually when, after we receive that HTML and it gets rendered, it's we call the hydrate root method. We generate the actual uh, component key and the virtual DOM and we attach it to the existing HTML. So that's what they call rehydration. On to question number 23, what are three ways sibling components can share state? Okay, so number one, probably the easiest is to lift that state to a parent, to a common ancestor, uh, to a common parent. Number two, I would say probably putting it in React context, for example, and then connecting both of them to that context. And then number three, probably using some state library like Redux or Flux or any other X state or two stand to actually connect both of them to the same state. Question number 24, name three disadvantages of global state. Number one disadvantage, if you abuse global state, you're going to trigger a lot of re-renders. You have so many components kind of subscribe to the same global state variable. Number two, you're adding a dependency. So you're coupling your code. It's going to be harder to move components around because they are attached to this global state dependency. And number three, 
testing will be harder because now every time you mock you want to test a specific component, you cannot test it in isolation. You need to mock the value of that global state. Those are the first three that come out to my mind. On to number 25. Can you tell me a disadvantage of using React context? Yeah, so I mentioned before that you might have different re-renders if you, if you abuse context. You also have this unique, all of a sudden, all the components are connected to context. You need to provide mocks, so less maintainability. And yeah, again, you don't want to abuse this. Use it as, as much as necessary, but as little as possible. On to number 26. Name five techniques, five, that I can make, I can use to make a front-end application faster. Okay, so number one would be adding a CDN. So you're serving your assets closer to the user. Number two, I would say compression. So compress all your assets, like Josip or uh, or Bradley, if you can, right. at the HTTP mm -hmm. level. Number three, caching. All these three things can be done by a CDN. Number four, bundle splitting. So do not uh, to use lazy loading. So download all your uh, JavaScript up front. If you can defer part of it, defer it. And number five, I would say image optimization. Images are usually a big reason why apps are slow. So uh, when I say image optimization, I would say yes, compression, yes, caching, but also format. So WebP, it's a much better format than any other on the web. If you use WebP, you'll be more efficient in the loading. Excellent. On to number 27, what is code splitting and how does it work? So code splitting, it's when you have our bundle, but you know for some reason that you'll not be using all of it, and you decide to load part of it on demand, okay, lazy loading. Uh, we can do this with in modern JavaScript because we have Webpack, which has a dependency tree, and for example, you have React Router, and we, together Webpack and the Router can work out what code you need on each route. So if the user goes on the home page, we then need to show them code from the profile page. So we can basically split our bundle into different chunks and load those chunks as the user needs them rather than loading everything up front. On to question number 28, which web core vital would be most affected by slow re-renders? Okay, so we're talking about re-render, which means the ones that are actually measuring the first loading do not apply. So this one doesn't apply, this one doesn't apply. Okay, maybe this one, this is where I have a doubt, so let's leave it on. First content of paint, no, it's not about re-render. Uh, the LCP can be, the CLS, it's usually not re-render. So we have the first input delay, probably and the interaction to next paint. I would say interaction to next paint is probably the most affected. Uh, the first input delay can be affected, but if when we think about, okay, we're getting a component too many times, so it's too expensive, this is probably, so the time it takes from a user interaction to actually painting the UI again. That's mm -hmm. the one. On to question number 29. Name three advantages and three disadvantages of using SSR server-side rendering, for example, next year's. SEO, it's a lot better because we deliver a pre-rendered HTML and the bots, the, the search engine bots, they can interpret a page. Uh, number two would be performance. We have much better FCP, for example, because we show something already to the user. And number three, in terms of advantages of SSR, I think SEO and web performance are the main advantages. So I'll lead with those ones. Let me go to the disadvantages and maybe the the advantage comes to my mind. So three disadvantages would be, number one would be complexity. So we need to set it up. It just takes a lot more to do certain things. Number two would be coupling. There is certain coupling between the front end and the back end. Things don't live separated anymore. There's so much we need to do together. And number three, I would say it's a lot of framework locking. So if you want to do SSI these days, you need to lock into something like Next.js and all of a sudden you need to learn in Next.js specific things, which is always almost a, a disadvantage because they've been releasing a new version every six months and you need to mm -hmm. adapt. Moving on to question number by 30, what are the top three challenges when building a micro frontends architecture? Okay, so we're building micro frontends. That means we're going to have like different frontends that deploy independently and then a shell that pulls them together. I'd say number one, it's maintaining visual consistency. Like they all have to share some shared CSS styles and that's never uh, so easy to do. Number two would be complexity. Uh, it takes a lot of sophisticated work to put those things together in the shell and make sure there's no errors. And number three would be shared state. So all of a sudden the shell, for example, has to inject authentication state or user settings in all these different micro frontends. Amazing bug and been challenging, but you made it until the end. If you're interviewing right now, check out the free technical assessment to find your gaps and your interview readiness. And we will see you folks in the next one.